My name is Braley Burke. I'm the Integrated Pest Management Specialist at FIPS. Um, I'm the entomologist here, but I also manage a lot of other pests. Let's get started with just a general background of what spotted lanternfly is. Um, and then we can answer your questions. So first off, what is spotted lanternfly? How did it get here? It's actually native to China, Japan, and Vietnam, and it's actually an invasive species in South Korea, which they've been dealing with for um, a little longer than us, I believe. Uh, an egg mass, this, that's what that picture is of. You can see that that could easily be mistaken for some sort of mud splatter or just a fungal growth on a tree. Um, it was accidentally imported to the US and that is how the first spotted lanternfly was, was introduced. It was probably introduced before 2014 and then it was actually detected in 2014 in Eastern Pennsylvania. I think it's actually amazing that it stayed out of this area for as long as it did. Um, considering it's been here since 2014, and we haven't seen a huge population until 2023, that's pretty good. Here is the spotted lanternfly life cycle. I got this picture from Penn State Spotted Lanternfly Management Guide, which I have used to reference what to do quite a bit. It's very useful. Um, and that'll be on a list of references at the end of this. But uh, pretty much it start, they start out in these egg cases. Uh, they they um, lay li lines of eggs and then they put a putty like coating over it that hardens and kind of looks like mud. Those are around from April to June. You want to scout for those if possible. If you find them, uh, smash them. Or uh, in some cases, you can scrape them off into uh, a bag of like 70% isopropyl alcohol that will kill them more thoroughly than if you smash them and happen to miss some eggs. Uh, then they hatch around April all the way through July. And uh, they, they look like little black uh, insects with white spots on them. And they'll get bigger over time, if you didn't notice this year. Some people actually at first thought maybe there were ticks or something like that, but they have that little snout to them and they have the white speckling. So that is kind of a way to identify them. They also hop, uh, making it way harder to smash them than a simple smash. Actually, whenever I first found one and tried to catch it, I was like, this is way faster than I expected. <laughs> Um, around this time of year, you might have noticed that they're turning red. That's their last nymphal stage. That's when they're still not adults yet, but they're getting close. And they're starting to develop little wing pads at this point. And um, some of the first adults are emerging at this point. As you can see, late July is whenever they're predicted to. And I've been starting to see the adults for the past couple weeks. Um, and Luckily, they, you don't have to look for egg masses until September because they hang out as adults for a bit and they don't start egg laying until September through November. And they'll stick around until hard frosts kill them off. Uh, and that's their life cycle. Here are some pictures of just spotted lanternfly stages I've seen around the tree is of the egg masses. I ended up scraping that mass off um, and smashing it. Uh, this, uh, let's see if I can get it to play. I just happened to walk across the Shenley Park Bridge and there were just, they were using it as a super highway, a bunch of them, which is really interesting because there aren't any plants to feed on, but they're using it to get from one side of the bridge to the other for some reason. Uh, the upper, this, this picture are the adults. They like to cluster together. They're on a grapevine there, which is one of their favorite plants to feed on. And this picture is the nymphs, both some little black ones and the red ones on a black walnut, which they also like a lot. Unfortunately, that's in my backyard. Mm -hmm. 
on top of them just being unsightly, I'm sure you guys are all annoyed with how many there are if you're in the Pittsburgh area. Unfortunately, when they feed on these trees, they excrete honeydew. They, they're, um, they're they're taking up so much of the plant sugars that they have to actually excrete the extra. So they excrete this honeydew, which makes all the stuff below them sticky, whether it's the tree or your plants below them or uh, your patio, whatever it is, it'll get sticky. And then that leads to sooty mold. And sooty mold isn't necessarily directly hurting your plants. Um, it just grows on that honeydew because it's eating the sugars and it can, if it gets bad enough, it can stop the plant from photosynthesizing well, but in small amounts, it's not going to do a lot of damage. So with spotted lanternfly, let's just summarize the bad news and then we'll go to the good news. I had it flipped and then I was like, I think it's better to get the bad news out of the way and then go to good news. So bad news. Allegheny County is at the contain and control phase, which means that we are not going to be eliminating these insects, most likely, or we're not. Um, with invasive species, you have thresholds of whether you can eliminate or whether you really just need to focus on containing and stopping them from stopping them from spreading to other areas that don't have them yet, and also controlling them to a manageable level. So. It's not like all hope is lost. It's just that we will have these insects. Uh, I think of it like the brown marmorated stink bugs, the stink bugs that got in your house. They used to be a big issue. Um, but over time, we found management strategies and were able to lower their populations. And for most people, other than my dad, he has a lot of them still, but they're not as big of an issue anymore. You will likely see more spot or many spotted lanternflies. If you haven't already, they get pretty numerous. I've heard or I've seen videos and seen uh, or heard from people who live in the eastern part of the state. They will get to pretty high levels and they're unsightly and kind of gross, unfortunately. They are very mobile. And this is a problem because, so say you have some on your precious tree, you treat it uh, with uh, insecticidal soap or something, you, you kill them off, maybe you vacuum them, whatever. Uh, new ones could appear very easily because they just are so mobile, they can actually move from one area to the next. Uh, so whenever you're treating an area or vacuuming them or what have you, there could be an issue with new ones migrating in. They produce honeydew, as I said, which makes things sticky, and that is not good news. And they may kill grapevines, very small trees, and already stressed out plants. On the good side, they do not bite or sting, so they will not hurt you. They cause less damage to plants than expected. Uh, when they first arrived, they were scared, or the Department of Agriculture was scared that they were going to cause way more damage to a lot more plants than they actually do. They are still concerning and they still affect grapevines, which is agriculturally significant, but really they haven't been found to actually kill most plants. They stress them out to an extent, um, but your whole garden is not going to die from spotted lanternfly. Um, they're mostly an aesthetic pest for homeowners. As I said, your garden's not going to die. They're not going to um, bite or sting you. So it's really just aesthetic. They are not appealing to see. They make sticky messes, unfortunately, but it could be worse um, if they actually were as bad for plants as previously thought. And the good news the big, the big good news is a lot of research is being done to figure out how to manage them. It does take time. Um, I've been to a couple entomology conferences over the past few years, and a lot of the research is 
focused on spotted lanternfly management and just figuring out what works, what doesn't, are there things that can attract them to traps? Um, what kind of plants are they feeding on? How can we use predators to feed on them, et cetera. And last bullet goes out to this cute little spider. It's a cute jumping spider. I know not everybody likes spiders, but how can you dislike him when he has a spotted lantern fly in his mouth? Um, <laughs> birds, mammals, and other insects are eating the spotted lantern flies. So there are natural predators out there that are doing their job with, of reducing the spotted lantern fly numbers. It's probably, I mean, ideally what it's gonna ha what's gonna happen is those animals that can feed on spotted lantern fly can then produce more young and next year we'll have more of them to control more spotted lantern flies, but we'll just have to see what happens. So with being in the contain and control phase, these are the counties as of 2023, according to the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. These are the ones that have spotted lanternfly in them. And the green ones are the ones that spotted lanternfly is established in. The blue ones are where they have found patches and you can actually see which, which uh, parts of the counties they found them in. Uh, so they're not necessarily established in those areas. When you travel from outside of your area, if you're in one of these green areas, you really wanna make sure that you're not taking spotted lanternflies with you or their egg masses, because you might actually be accidentally introducing them to these areas that don't have them yet. And that's the biggest way you can help with the situation, I would say is to stop them from spreading. Um, and I actually just watched a video on some research being done on how well they can spread um, if they're clinging to a car. And they could cling, some stages could cling to a car like the windshield wipers um, when a car was going up to 80 miles per hour. So it they are very good at finding ways to be transported. They'll also, cling to your clothing sometimes or hop into your car window, things like that. So definitely just be aware if you're traveling and don't spread them. And of course, there are maps of outside of Pennsylvania and you can find those. I did not include it in this presentation, um, but there are other parts of the country all, that you should definitely also not be spreading it to if, if you're going outside of Pennsylvania. Uh, just so you know, one of the things that the state is doing to try and address this issue is if you're a business that is transporting things outside of those green areas or within, then they actually are supposed to have a permit for spotted lanternflies where you do a class on how to check your vehicle and um, items that you're transporting and make sure that you're not spreading it to other things. That's one thing that's being done. If you didn't know and you're a business, now you know. Management. Um, this is how you can physically or mechanically uh, manage the spotted lanternflies. Of course, you can smash them and their eggs or put the eggs in alcohol. That's one method. You can use a shop vac to vacuum them up. That's one of our horticulturists vacuuming our grapevine. Uh, what you do is you get a wet vac and put soapy water in it. The soap helps break the surface tension so that they drown. So when they're being vacuumed up, they're actually drowning and not just floating on the water because sometimes that can happen. Um, my Coworker LD has a method called the LD method where she knocks all of them out of her grapevine or tree with a hose. And then she goes around her yard vacuuming them up before they can crawl back up the, um, the tree. And she says she found pretty good success with that actually. And new ones haven't migrated in yet, which is pretty impressive. So that's one option. And then they're using traps. You can use sticky traps, but it has been found that 
Um, Non-target things can get stuck to them, including birds and small mammals when they're trying to crawl up the tree. So if you did use um, sticky tape around the base of the tree, that's what this picture is of, that all the little spotted lanternflies stuck on it. You actually wanna put chicken wire around the sticky tape to stop things from accidentally getting stuck. It'll actually guard the tape and stop any birds or small mammals. You can also build this thing called a circle trap. And it kind of just, whenever spotted lanternflies want to go up a tree, they always just crawl up. They don't fly usually. They'll walk up the um, trunk of the tree. And the circle traps take advantage of that by catching the ones as they're walking up and just getting them stuck in netting pretty much um, instead of the stickiness. Management for biological uh, control. Uh, biological just means using other organisms to manage them. Uh, as I said before, birds, mammals, and other insects have been found to eat the spotted lanternfly, which is promising. They're actually doing studies where they're studying the natural predators of spotted lanternfly in its native country and range and seeing if there are any that could, that could be introduced here without damaging the environment, but while taking care of our spotted lanternfly issue. Um, there is also, before going on to that, there's also work being done on finding fungal pathogens that could um, affect the spotted lanternfly population and whether we could use something like that to control them. That's actually how we, or how entomologists figure out how, figured out how to manage the gypsy moth or spongy moth population that used to be a huge issue. And they actually found a virus and fungus that affects them and they'll release that in the forests and manage the population of these those invasive caterpillars. So we may find something like that for spotted lanternfly. Until then, I very much recommend protecting your natural predators. And to do this, you don't want to be dumping pesticides to kill your spotted lanternflies. Because they are more of an aesthetic pest, unless you have something it's highly valued and stressed out and spotted lanternfly is likely to kill it. I don't recommend using pesticides, especially ones that are gonna stay in the environment for a long time and affect other things like our pollinators, our natural predators that like those spiders that are feeding on them um, and just like the whole ecosystem. It's, I, I'm a little worried that because of the spotted lanternfly, uh, infestation, invasion, people are going to use a lot of pesticides and possibly use them incorrectly or overuse them. And that could actually cause more of an issue than the spotted lanternfly. So word of warning. Um, you can also help your natural predators by providing habitat for them. A lot of them like flowers and then they'll move on to um, killing things like uh, spotted lanternfly. And lastly, be patient. Uh, it might take a while, but our natural predators could help with managing these insects. Uh, it's just going to take time for things to balance out. For chemicals, don't use them unless you have to. And if you use them, use less toxic options. Um, insecticidal soap has actually been found to be useful for managing not just the nymphs, but the adults as well. Um, neem oil can be effective and horticultural oil is not recommended. It was not found to be effective. Um, the only thing with the insecticidal soap and neem oil to keep in mind is I talked to some people from Penn State and they did studies to see the e efficacy and they worked, but it took 48 hours for them to actually, these pesticides to actually kill the spotted lanternfly. So you might apply this and see the spotted lanternfly hopping away or not dying. It takes time and it can actually take a couple days for it to take effect, but it can work. 
And lastly, don't use household chemicals. I have heard from a lot of people asking about, will vinegar work? Will pine saw work? Um, some, I, I've even heard just put bleach on them. Don't do that. <laughs> when you do things like that, um, well, the, the pesticides available have actually been tested and um, there are guidelines on how to use it and how you can not, or how you can use it without hurting the environment. Whereas a lot of these household chemicals, like for instance, pine saw is actually a registered pesticide, but it's for disinfecting, not killing insects. So when you use it inappropriately, it can actually be bad for the environment and have uh, unknown consequences. Uh, with vinegar, you can actually hurt your plants. And unless you're using very heavy duty vinegar, it probably isn't killing the spotted lanternflies. I just recommend actually using um, products or methods that have been found to help without throwing whatever you have at your yard or house or what have you. So takeaway, spotted lanternflies will remain in this area, though I think over time they'll get to a more manageable level. It will just take time. They are very mobile and difficult to control. Even if you use pesticides that are stronger on them, they could move back into your area just because they are pretty mobile. Um, they will not hurt you and will probably not kill your plants unless you have grapevines, then they might do some damage to those or some saplings. Avoid chemical control if possible. Try Try and help our environment out because if everybody who has spotted lantern fly in their yards uses chemical control, uh, th that's probably not great for the environment. And don't spread spotted lantern fly to areas without established population. So as I was saying, if you're traveling somewhere outside of areas that already have spotted lantern fly, make sure that you're inspecting your vehicle or what you're traveling with and making sure you're not spreading them. And give science and technology time to find solutions. They're definitely doing a lot to find solutions. It's just gonna take time for them to make sure and be extra cautious with recommendations and everything so that they know what they're recommending is actually going to be beneficial. All right, now I'm ready to take questions. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Braley. We did have uh, a bunch of questions come in. We will try to answer as many as we can. Um, just a reminder, if you had put a question into the chat, if you could retype that into the Q&A, um, we are looking for all of our questions in the Q&A area. Um, so Braley, my first questions are sort of, um, geography based. Um, there are two here that I wanted to ask. Um, so the first is, is it expected that spotted lantern flies will spread to most of the United States? They're still doing research on that. And um, actually, it seems like spotted lantern fly can't handle certain temperatures when it gets too high. So there's probably going to be a cutoff point for the south. As far as the north, um, it's probably more likely to spread north than south, but they're still trying to work all of those details out. It has been detected in the Midwest a few times already. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember if they have an established population or they were able to eliminate those populations, but there, it's unclear how much it could spread. Okay. Um, the other question is, um, Okay, it says, how is the spotted lantern fly native to China and Japan, but invasive to Korea? <laughs> um, well, if you think about how big China is, um, it could be like the lower part of China and then Japan, they all have their different ecosystems. Japan's a, an island. And then North Korea has that peninsula there. They tend to have like cooler climates. They're more temperate for the most part. It's just like how our invasive 
cohesive in the West, but native in the East and vice versa. So sometimes just because of geography, I'm not super knowledgeable about um, East Asian geography, but I bet there are some natural borders that have stopped spotted lanternflies from naturally migrating to South Korea in the past okay. and along with their natural predators. So, so sorry, just one more question associated with that. So, um, so has Korea been using any techniques different from those used in the United States or Pennsylvania? Um, the United States has definitely been consulting South Korea, but what I have read about has mostly just referenced that South Korea does have an issue and it's actually um, hurting their fruit tree um, industry as well as their grapevines, but that doesn't seem to be happening here yet. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of references specifically to what South Korea is doing, and I can't read South Korean. <laughs> Cool. So I have some questions. Um, there is a group of questions of people that were asking, what are the high risk plants? There are some folks that are saying they've been on their tomato plants um, and their tomato plant didn't make it. Um, they've been on various other plants. Um, but what are the high risk plants and what does what is the level of damage? Um, the high risk plants for spotted lanternfly is what you're yes. asking. Mm -hmm. I think they're still like, honestly, they're adding more and more host plants to what spotted lanternflies will attack all the time. Um, as a botanical garden, I am just blown away by how much range they have. The high risk though, really for as far as like, will they kill them is grapevines, uh, saplings, and they'll also sometimes kill tree of heaven, which is an invasive tree anyway. So that's actually a plus. But other than that, there haven't actually, I haven't been hearing a lot about them call crop damage, like on tomatoes and things like that. Got it. Oh, I did want to include So if earlier in the year you saw a lot on your roses, they're probably starting to not be on there anymore. Oh. Um, your internet connection seems to be a little bit spotty, Braley, um, but oh. we'll do the best we can um, with, with the Q&A. Just you sort of um, dropped out a little bit there, but I think we got, got the gist of it at the end. Um, okay. Okay, so someone is asking, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about the natural predators that spotted lantern flies? And I don't know if you can speak to their native habitat and the natural predators they have there, um, but I guess also just, just reiterating the, the natural predators we've seen locally as well. Yeah, so the natural predators, um, I didn't see a lot of specifics because I was reading papers on it and it's really more of citizen scientists reporting what's been feeding on them. Praying mantises have been feeding on them, different spiders, um, chipmunks to an extent, birds. Um, I've heard woodpeckers will eat them. Uh, it, it's just those generalists in our environment that will eat anything. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's interesting. Uh, Spotted lanternfly accumulate the toxins of the plants they're feeding on. So uh, a, a spotted lanternfly that's feeding on black walnut, I imagine would taste really bad. But a spotted lanternfly that feeds on grapevines, I think would maybe taste better. That's just the speculation, but I'm wondering if what they're eating also affects who's eating them. Uh, in their natural setting, they know that there are wasps that will eat them or parasitize them. Uh, they're studying those right now. And there are probably a lot of generalists that just keep them in check. They're not a huge issue there at all in their native range.
Okay, next question, group of questions I see are about sticky traps. Um, mm -hmm. So is it best to put sticky tape at the base of the tree? Um, where can you buy the sticky traps? Um, and how do you orient chicken wire around the sticky traps to protect the beneficial things that we would like to keep? Um, if you want something, there's probably resources out there that can actually tell you step by step if you want that information. But I would say just around the base of the tree so it's not too close to the ground, maybe about breast to eye level. Um, you can purchase things like Tanglefoot on, or, or other sticky tapes on Amazon or what have you. They might have them at Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, and you want to dome the chicken wire around so it's not touching the sticky tape. So, you know, you're not getting your chicken wire all sticky, but you want it to make it so if like a chipmunk's crawling up it will go over the sticky tape instead of getting stuck to it or going under the chicken wire and getting stuck to it. So definitely just be aware of that. Think common sense wise, how you would want to orient it. So things aren't going to get on the tape. Uh, Braylee, my questions are about the egg masses. There's a few different. So one question was like, when at like, when should we start looking for egg masses uh, to, to destroy them? Um, where, like, are the egg masses generally in reach or out of reach for us to scrape and destroy? Mm -hmm. Sorry. And a third question about the egg masses is like, what is the best way to remove them from a car if you're traveling? Will a car wash remove them? Um. So if you, I'm trying to think, there, that's a lot of questions about egg masses. You probably want to start looking for them. I believe I, whenever I showed the life cycle, it said they start laying eggs about September. So I'd say September, October is when you would start looking for them. Uh, they look more putty-like and shiny when they're fresh. And then they start crumbling and look more like dry mud when they get older, just so you know. A lot of them are actually not at our level, unfortunately. So they will be laying their eggs high up in trees or in vines that you can't reach, um, which is unfortunate, but you can at least do what you can with smashing the ones that you find, especially if they're on vehicles or things that you, you might be moving around. That's important. Uh, as far as car washes, I'm not really sure if car washes would clean them off. I think it just depends on where they'd be located um, and how much pressure was behind it. I would say if you find one on your car, like you found like a sticky mass, you should probably scrape it off with like a credit card or something and smash it as best you can just to make sure. Um, even if you do happen to run through the car wash and maybe you could test that and tell me how it goes. If you happen to run your car through the car wash and see if it goes away, if you don't see it anymore, <laughs> then it probably was effective. Okay. Next questions are about um, tree of heaven. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of like knowing that that's an invasive um, plant to this area. Is there away since the spotted lantern flies really enjoy them is it best like how do you manage both invasives is it best to cut the tree down or how do you balance that yeah that, and the reason i didn't go too much into tree of heaven for this is that it is difficult um phipps actually has been managing our tree of heaven by removing them but it's, it's a process. Um, I ended up talking to the Department of Agriculture about it and they have a guide on how to re um, remove your tree of heaven. You have to treat them at a certain time of year. If you just chop them down, they oftentimes from their roots will just sprout new trunks, unfortunately. So they're very difficult to remove, but they are kind of like a beacon for spotted lanternfly. They enjoy they enjoy um, Tree of Heaven a lot. That's, they're both 
from the same native range. So they have a relationship. Um, you could remove them and it might help, but I, I think it's kind of, it's, un, I'm unsure as to how effective that would be because they may just move to other things if the tree of heaven is not there. But if you wanna remove it, it is invasive also. So it's not a bad thing to remove. Uh, thank, thanks for that, Braley. We have a bunch of questions. People are asking if they are, if the spotted lantern flies are harmful um, to dogs or cats. They are not harmful to dogs and cats. They will not bite or sting or anything. They actually don't even have biting mouth parts. They have a mouth part like a straw that they stick into the tree. And so they won't be harming any bigger creatures. And uh, sorry, just a follow-up question to go along with the pet question is, um, do you think that's, that um, there was a question about are pets able to transport spotted lantern fly? Like, do you think they'll get on pets and like be able to move that way? Any thoughts? It's a possibility. They could cling to your pet just like they could cling to your shirt. I don't think they'd be laying eggs on your pets or anything like that. But just if you happen to have like a, a some sort of animal that has hair that a spotted lanternfly could cling to, it could just happen to be in there and maybe just check that out before you move your pet somewhere outside of Allegheny County. All right, thanks. Okay, there are some questions about um, sprays. So there are questions about white vinegar. Um, does that harm plants? There have been some questions about Dawn dish soap. So I guess, can you speak on um, the different types of like DIY or home bought products that are available for people to use? Um, and I know you mentioned no spray, but there have been some folks that have said that like Dawn dish soap has worked for them. Um, so I'm, I would say instead of using Dawn dish soap, if you were going to go that route, you should probably use insecticidal soap. It's, it is soap, but it's designed to put on your plants to kill pests so that it doesn't hurt your plants. Um, with Dawn dish soap, the problem is it has detergents in it and it can actually remove the waxy coating from your plants. It can definitely hurt them if you use it a lot over time or if you use it whenever it's really hot and sunny outside. Uh, that's why insecticidal soap's better for your plant. Um, but if you are willing to risk your plants and you find that it works, you could try it, I guess. I haven't tried it personally, so I don't know how well it works. For vinegar, I would imagine because I've I've tried to use vinegar on like ants and things like that for um, management. And I found that they kind of stun the insect but don't kill it, though it could be different for spotted lanternfly, but vinegar is a natural um, herbicide. And I think maybe in, in cooking vinegar quantities, it's probably going to be less likely to harm your plant. They have horticultural grade vinegar, which is way more concentrated and that's used as an herbicide. And that might kill your spotted lanternflies, but it would definitely also kill your plants. Follow-up question to that. Can you talk more about what insecticidal soap is and where people can purchase that? Um, so insecticidal soap uh, is, pretty much a, the active ingredient is potassium salts of fatty acids, which, which is the active ingredient for soap, more so like old timey soap before we use more detergents. So it messes with the insect's membrane and makes it so that they die. Uh, and it doesn't, it's less likely to hurt your plants. Though if you apply it on a very sunny, hot day, it can still burn your plants. Um, I purchase safer brand insecticidal soap on Amazon whenever I'm using it for the greenhouses. Um, but I believe there are other options probably available at hardware stores and things like that. Thank you.
Um, okay, so along with that, uh, there's questions about neem oil. I guess, could you explain what neem oil is and how you would use it? Yeah, neem oil is, um, it's an essential oil pretty much from a tree that has an insecticidal property. So it's naturally derived um, and concentrated into this neem. And it, it, the oil can clog the insects um, breathing organs to make it harder for them to breathe and they can suffocate. And it also stops them from properly maturing um, if they're in the younger stages. Um, I usually just use horticultural oil here and don't use neem oil very often. Um, but in the case of spotted lanternfly, horticultural oil has not been found to be as effective. So you probably want to go to neem. Um, but it's just, it's less likely to harm all of the organisms in your environment, though I still recommend using it sparingly because it is an insecticide and it will probably to an extent damage other things in your environment, other insects. Did I get the whole of that question? Uh, well, I guess the, the question was how, how to use it. Like, is it just a, a oh, spray? It's a spray. Okay. Um, and with any pesticide you use, 100% read the label. It will answer all of your questions on how much to use, how to use it, what the restrictions are, how not to hurt your plants. So definitely read the label. Okay, there are some folks said they didn't catch what you said about the rose bushes because there are a lot of questions about people's rose bushes being affected. Um, so I'll start there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so what I was saying is that when they're younger, they actually feed on more herbaceous things and uh, have a different preference from when they're older. Uh, um, and when they're they're younger, they actually like rose bushes a lot, but as they mature, they are more likely to migrate to things like trees and more woody plants as opposed to those rose bushes or herbaceous plants that you have. So you might actually notice as they're becoming adults, they're not going to rose bushes anymore. So another question um, for the egg masses, there are folks that are asking um, how far up are those egg masses usually laid? Like, are they usually like at the base of trees? Like, are they in a place that are accessible for folks to kind of destroy if they sight them? Yeah, unfortunately, most of them are not going to be at levels that we can easily reach. Um, in that Penn State Management Guide, I think they have a graphic that says something like 5% are within reach of humans and the rest are higher in the tree's canopy, unfortunately. Or they'll lay them on the sides of buildings and things pretty high up because the older the insects get, the more they wanna migrate upward. But you can do your part smashing the insect um, or the egg cases that you can't reach. Thank you. Uh, okay, so here are a few questions people are asking about, um, for example, if I have, if I had a lot of spotted lantern flies on like my rose bush, should I, should I cut it back? You know, should I cut it down? Um, another question was, um, do you recommend cutting down trees that are infested? And, and then sort of a separate question, but around the same idea of like trimming, uh, does trimming trees or shrubs attract spotted lantern flies? Um, so as far as cutting back your plants or trimming them, it, I'm not sure how effective that is. It really just depends on what else is around you. They might just migrate to their second favorite thing. Um, if you cut down a tree, uh, I would say the only benefit there, I, the, I, the tree of heaven obviously is more attractive to them 
than any other tree. But if you had a black walnut right next to it, that's their second favorite tree. And they probably just all migrate there, which is the problem. But if you had trees that they weren't attracted to, and that was the only one they were attracted to, it could be beneficial. So it's really just, it depends on the layout and they're still trying to figure out what the best recommendation is for that um, as far as spotted lanternflies go. Uh, what was the other part of the question? Um, will trim it, like if, if I'm cutting back something, does that somehow attract, um, spotted lantern flies? I haven't heard that. I mean, it, it possibly could because the plants are pretty much when they're tr trimmed back, they're screaming with their volatile chemicals. Ah, I'm damaged. So it might signal to the spotted lantern flies that there's a stressed plant that they could go to, but I'm not sure if that would make them like swarm to a plant necessarily. Okay, thank you. Um, I saw a couple of questions, a um, couple more questions about the effects on um, animals or pets. Um, if dogs or cats were to ingest them, um, is that harmful? Will it make them sick or do they carry any diseases that could possibly get them sick? It's actually really lucky that so far spotted lanternfly has not been found to carry any, any diseases for either plants or animals. So that's not a problem. Um, as far as if your pet eats them, I think they might get like a little sick because they taste bad. I did have a coworker that ate one to just try it out though, and he's still alive. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think that they would necessarily if like only one was eaten and I don't think your pet would want to eat another one. I don't think it would cause issues though. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. Um, so there was a question and I don't, I don't think you talked to, did you say anything about alcohol? People are wondering if you could use alcohol to kill them or if alcohol would be um, like isopropyl alcohol would be bad for the environment. Isopropyl alcohol would be an expensive solution for sure. Uh, if you soak spotted lanternfly in them, it will kill them. Um, but if you spray them, I think you, you might, it makes it easier to stomp on them because they kind of get stunned, but they wouldn't die from being sprayed with isopropyl alcohol. Unless you wanted to like pick them all up and put them in alcohol and drown them in it, that would work. Um, sorry, I'm still going through some of these questions. I, I guess, well, um, Je oh, go ahead, yeah, Jess. No, you go ahead, Juliet. Well, I was just going to say, um, people are asking about like what types of birds feed on spotted lanternfly. I wonder if you have any, you know, research you found on like what local birds would eat them. I have not seen any. Uh, oh no. I'll ask that question again when we get Braley back. Okay. <laughs> I are there issues? Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah, you went out just for a little bit. So the question was like if you know uh types of birds that would eat them. Okay. Um yeah, so I don't know many types. I just haven't taken a deep dive into the bird literature. I just have heard that woodpeckers will eat them. Okay. Uh, Jess, did you have another question? I do have one more. Um, there are some questions. So I know there's like that sticky mildew that they'll leave that you mentioned, correct? Um, and then they also will bring like sooty mold. Um, are there any, like, how do you treat those? I guess, if you see them on plants? Um, if you see them on plants, you can clean them off. I have actually had a really hard time. We have some honeydew and sooty mold at Phipps and it's difficult to clean off, unfortunately. Um, 
I don't have any great solutions for that other than rain will clean it off, hosing it off will clean it off to an extent. It shouldn't get as bad as in a conservatory because it never rains in there. Um, but yeah, naturally it will eventually come off, but it is, it'll really stick to your plants. Uh, is it possible that spotted lantern flies would attract snakes? I don't think so. I don't, I, whenever I was reading about the natural predators, uh, reptiles were not included in that. And I don't think that most snakes would be interested in spotted lantern fly. Okay. Um, now they're, oops, sorry. No, go ahead. While you're doing that, Jazz, I'm just going to share some of some resources. So I'm going to um, share my screen while you're um, asking the final few questions. Perfect. Um, there's a question about trees again. Um, what does the damage on trees look like? How will, what are the signs that people know that the nymphs are stressing it out, um, whether it's a sapling or like a bigger tree? Um, so it'll, the most noticeable damage, because they're only sucking the fluids from the trees, you'd never find like bite marks or anything like that. It's not removing the plant material. Um, what you'd see is distortion of growth. So the leaves wouldn't be developing correctly. Um, and they'd look kind of funky. That would be the damage that you'd be most likely to notice. Got it. Um, so I, I do want to, you know, if we have time, I want to answer, ask and answer more questions, but I wanted to make people aware of some of these resources. Um, so this page here is a list of resources that, that Braley had shared. Um, Braley, do you want to say um, anything about these resources? Sure. Um, the Spotted Lanternfly Management Guide from Penn State has been really useful for me um, as far as just knowing when to treat, how to treat, things like that. I definitely recommend that. It's a good resource. If you're interested in trying to build a circle trap, which is that non-sticky option, uh, they have a guide, Penn State has a guide for that. Um, if you're a business and you think that you might need to get permitting for spotted lanternfly and you want to um, look into that, that's the link for that. You can also just look up Spotted lantern fly, fly quarantine PA and find it. And the last one was just a paper I read on the management of spotted lantern fly for 2023. If you're looking to take a really deep dive in there. Nice. Um, so, you know, we've had over a hundred questions in the, in the Q and A, so it's impossible to be able to answer all of those questions. Um, I did want everyone to be aware we have a resource called Ask Dr. Phipps. So you can use this email address. It's drphipps at phipps.conservatory.org. Um, please, you know, send us any more of your questions. If you had a question that didn't get answered today, um, you can email us um, here. Um, I know that when we, we promoted this event, we said spotted lanternfly and other summer pests. We weren't sure, you know, how many people would be interested in the spotted lanternfly. But if you did have other pest questions that we didn't get to, uh, please, please send those email questions to us. Uh, I also wanted to share other resources that FIPS has on our website. We have our top 10 sustainable plants and uh, the sustainable land care principles. Uh, you know, one of the things that Braley really promotes is um, having healthy plants and, and as a pre preventative tool is just, you know, uh, using good gardening practices to keep your plants very healthy will help to minimize the damage done by, uh, by pests. So this is a great guide for you. And if you need help um, from local land care professionals, we have a list of people who have um, gone through FIPS Sustainable Land Care Accreditation and can help with, you know, uh, potentially removing Tree of Heaven or other, other issues that you have on your property. So these are some great resources for you. Um, and, and that does... Um, bring us to the end of our time. And so I just want to thank you again for, for being with us today. We will send out a copy of our this, this presentation and this talk 
um, so that you can review it further or um, feel free to share it. Uh, but thanks again. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful day and uh, not too much more trouble with the spotted lanternfly. Thanks a lot.